together with Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler, Carl Gustav Jung was one of the founders of psychoanalysis, or the so-called modern depth psychology, a field of science focusing on dealing with the unconscious energies which move through each of us. In spite of being highly praised by Freud, Jung departed from his teachings, eventually founding his own school of psychology called analytical psychology. Some of the most important concepts in Jung's work are personality typology, individuation, and also archetypes like persona, the shadow, anima, and animus. In this context, an archetype is a universal model common in many cultures which influences human behavior. In spite of the fact he's mainly considered a psychoanalyst, Jung made huge contributions to the realm of philosophy. His particular take on the subject is often referred to as Jungian philosophy. He wrote many books like Psychology of the Unconscious, Man and His Symbols, The Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, The Psychology of the Transference, Memories, Dreams and Thoughts, and The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. His entire work was about how to help people navigate through the complexity of their psyche, to help them understand themselves better in order to heal. Jung was particularly interested in the process of individuation, how to express the true essence of your personality, and how to develop yourself into a mature and whole person. When people can harmonize their consciousness, the part of the psyche which is aware of and responsive to its surroundings with their unconsciousness, the part of the psyche in which mental and psychological activities take place without the individual's awareness, they can understand their self, which is their psyche as a whole, unifying the consciousness and the unconsciousness. Learning how to know yourself is crucial, so to help you learn more about how to know yourself better, here are seven teachings from the wisdom of Carl Jung. Number one, draw mandalas. Carl Jung said, the mandala is the path to the center, to individuation. According to Jung, the self can be represented in the form of a mandala, which is a circle containing different sectors. It's a diagram with different components in it, each one representing an aspect that reveals the self. Oftentimes, it looks like a circle, which, according to Jung, reflects a sacred space. When you draw your own personal mandala, it becomes one of the best ways to see your inner self in its most essential aspects. At the center of the figure, the core of the self resides. The self is the central aspect of an individual's personality and life. Then, around the circle, are the outer world and inner world. The top half is the outer world and represents our surroundings and environment. The bottom half shows the inner world, what is deep inside us. The outer world is in connection with consciousness, ego, and persona. Consciousness is everything that we know directly. Ego is the entity that helps us organize everything that we perceive, think, memorize, and feel, and persona is essentially the role that we play in society. When the ego is overwhelmed with feelings, perceptions, or thoughts, some of them are redirected to personal unconsciousness, often coming back into our consciousness for a brief moment while dreaming. The inner world, on the bottom half, is in connection with the collective unconsciousness, with the shadow, anima, and animus, all of which are sources of communication between the consciousness and the collective unconsciousness. Collective unconsciousness is separate from personal unconsciousness. It's the part that binds people together through invisible ways. Jung used this concept to explain the similarities in mythologies around the world. He believed that the collective unconsciousness had a profound influence on the lives of individuals, containing symbols, so-called archetypes, that provide individuals meaning regarding the life experiences they go through. 
The shadow, part of the inner world, is considered to be the most dangerous aspect of the self, consisting of all the unacceptable animalistic, aggressive or sexual instincts. Usually, people are not very aware of their shadow, which is often projected onto other people and objects. The anima and animus duo is related to a masculine-feminine polarity. Anima is the feminine side of the male form, while animus is the masculine side of the female form. Self is the overarching energy that integrates and organizes our personality by bringing together the conscious and unconscious processes. Mandala is not only a form of art, but also a psychotherapy tool which each of us can use. For a period of time, Jung used to draw mandalas every day, and he analyzed the state of his psyche by looking at the mandala he'd just drawn. He also encouraged his patients to draw their own mandalas. There are many training courses in how to draw mandalas, and we can also try to draw one each day in order to understand ourselves a bit better. For example, one patient of Jung drew these three mandalas at different times. The first one shows the four stages of the moon, then on the second mandala, the sun appears, which reflects a bigger difference between the surroundings and unconsciousness, thus a lesser connection between the self and the surroundings. Then, in the end, in the third mandala, the sun is about to set. The patient had drawn the last mandala shortly before his death. As colors, yellow usually represents intuition, Blue represents the mind, red represents feelings, and brown represents sensations. Based on what colors and shapes we use when we draw the mandala, ideally with the help of a psychotherapist, we can identify the corresponding archetypes that could then be interpreted to make sense of our internal struggles. Number 2. Understand your subconscious impulses. According to Jung, Everyone carries a shadow, and the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. The shadow is one of the most important archetypes, according to Jung. It is a part of our subconscious that comes to the surface in the most unexpected moments, often taking us by surprise. The shadow is that part of ourselves that we fail to recognize and which comes to the surface through dreams or through subconscious impulses in daily life. We've all had moments where we did something, yet immediately after had no clue why we did it. Perhaps we got angry at something or someone out of the blue, went into a different room or we answered a question in a bizarre way without knowing the reason. Perhaps it was the shadow that directed us. The more rigidly you act in real life, the more you follow rules made by others or your self-imposed rules disregarding your emotions, the more you fail to acknowledge your shadow. If you do so, you will fail to know yourself. Ergo, you can only truly know yourself if you also know your shadow. And this process of knowing your shadow can take a good amount of effort. Often, the things we discover in our shadow are unpleasant as our shadow includes the dark parts of ourselves, our aggressive tendencies and repressed sexual desires, anything that we cannot accept in our everyday social behavior. But the bitter irony is that the more we try to keep away from those dark parts, the more they control our lives in invisible ways. And when this happens, we often project all those negative attitudes onto others. For example, every time you talk intensely negatively about someone else, you can be confident that all those negative traits are also inside you, in your shadow. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so passionately involved in that discussion. When you judge someone for how they look, perhaps you say they're overweight, badly dressed, or too skinny, chances are you're insecure about yourself as well, and to avoid feeling anxiety, your psyche makes you project those negative feelings which are part of your shadow onto others. To stop projecting and start taking control of your shadow, you need to first become aware of when you're projecting. Stop yourself every time you think or talk with passion about something negative in other people and examine yourself in the same way. 
Is there any other negative feeling that you need to be aware of and is it related to you personally? For example, if you catch yourself speaking badly about a colleague who uses their charisma to get away with anything at work, it's likely that you actually wish you had that charisma for yourself to get ahead in life in the same way, but you don't know how to do it. So instead, you prefer to accuse the other of playing unfairly. By questioning yourself, you can discover many unpleasant things about yourself, and by discovering them, you'll know what you need to work on so you can become free of them, and that way, they won't control your life anymore. Knowing your shadow is a part of knowing your true self. Number 3. Know Your Fears In the words of Jung, find out what a person fears most, and that is where he will develop next. Jung treated many patients suffering from anxiety disorder and he understood that what they needed most was the courage to face their own fears. He found it to be good practice to analyze their fears, because after that analysis, he could understand in which direction they should develop. Unfortunately, however, many choose not to take any risks in life, preferring to give up on their dreams than to fail and potentially embarrass themselves. When this tendency overwhelms individuals, they can become neurotic. No matter how courageous we look to society, we all have our own fears. Nobody in the world is truly fearless. What we can learn from Jung's studies on his patients regarding facing their inner fears is that by analyzing our fears, we can discover which area of our life we should work on. If we permanently avoid facing our fears, we will remain in a cocoon in a comfortable space, but that won't make us happy in the long run. By refusing to look inside ourselves, by refusing to know ourselves better and finding solutions for our fears, we will stop growing. For example, your fear of public speaking might prevent you from advancing in your career. You avoid speaking up during big meetings or participating actively in business conferences. Overcoming your fear can only happen once you start getting to know your fear better. Identify it. Acknowledge it. Then, find reasons why this fear is unfounded. In the case of our example, analyze the ideas you had in your mind and why you didn't put them forward. Were they better than those of your colleagues? If yes, then you had no reason not to express your idea in the meeting. To start speaking more in public, you can practice in front of a mirror or, better yet, record yourself and review the video. Not only will you be able to see what you do and don't like and correct for it, you'll also get more comfortable hearing your voice and seeing yourself in that context, which means you'll feel more confident, which will improve your performance. If your fear has deeper roots, perhaps caused by a traumatic event during your childhood, then you need to look deep inside your memory ideally with the help of a licensed psychotherapist, to identify and confront those moments. To really know yourself and evolve, one of the best ways is to face your fears and the roots of those fears. Number 4. Face Your Emotions Carl Jung tells us, People will do anything, no matter how absurd, to avoid facing their own souls. According to Jung, psychological diseases like neuroses have always been at the base of legitimate suffering. This suffering is often buried so deep inside us that it becomes very difficult to deal with. The painful emotions that we often fear to face are developed from trauma, rejection, loss, failure or abandonment. It's not enough to be mentally aware of those buried emotions it's also important to have the courage to feel them in their raw form, to truly face them. When we're too afraid to face them, we mask them. We go into self-harming activities, addictions, or we close our hearts, adopt more rigid behavior, and are afraid to show our suffering. The way to stop running away from facing our soul is to understand first that it is not the event that traumatized us, but rather the set of beliefs we built afterwards around that event. Maybe after you suffered that traumatic episode, you started to see yourself as a worthless human being, 
not good enough or deserving enough. Once you identify these beliefs, you need to start questioning them. Find evidence in your present life that these beliefs are not true and build a better, more positive belief system about yourself. For example, imagine you were raised in a dysfunctional family with alcoholic parents that regularly neglected you, making you feel worthless but also ashamed of them. Just as your parents neglected you as a child, as an adult you find your partner is doing the same and all those past memories now come and haunt you. The sadness you feel because of your partner will be amplified by the sadness you have from your childhood, making everything worse, preventing you from focusing on even your most basic daily tasks, potentially even resulting in clinical depression. You shouldn't run away from those early memories about your childhood, but rather investigate the belief system you inherited from it and question it. One example of a belief that influences you negatively can be that you think you're not lovable enough, that you don't deserve love, and that if someone got to know you better, they wouldn't like you, and that if they do show that they like you, you believe that there must be something wrong with them. You need to change such a belief system with a better one, one that better reflects the worthy person you are today. An example of a belief system that would help you feel more lovable could be to start telling yourself that indeed you're not perfect, but nor is anyone else, and that's fine. You try to work on yourself every day, putting effort into self-development, trying to be fair with other people. You give your best in your work and go all in on your relationships. Have your own validation first, then look for other people's validation. You can only build positive emotions on a solid foundation of self-love, a good knowledge of yourself and what you're capable of. Your vision of yourself will become clearer if you investigate your deepest emotions, your inner suffering and the beliefs you've built around it. You cannot really know yourself if you don't have the courage to examine your soul and emotions inside out. Number 5. Understand your dreams To quote Carl Jung, Dreams are the facts from which we must proceed. Jung considered dreams as being messages from the unconscious. They have the role to re-establish the psychic equilibrium. Whatever was not fully processed by the conscious mind during the day comes back to haunt us in our dreams. Jung believed that dream material mainly contains repressed feelings that we don't want to face anymore so he created a method for interpreting the dreams that he called active imagination. First of all, the patients had to write their dream just after they woke up from sleep. Then they had to identify the key symbols appearing in the dream and make associations between them, connecting them with their daily life events. Through this process of active imagination, Jung guided his patients through a process of reliving the dream while still awake. The purpose was to get the story inside the story of the dream. No matter how silly the story of the dream is, Jung believed, there is always a deeper meaning. By reliving the dream, we force ourselves to interact with the dream figures actively, emotionally, and by living that emotion, we get in touch with the deepest layers of ourselves. If Freud interpreted dreams only as ways to discover repressed sexual instincts, for Jung, a dream can have more dimensions, including archetypes and cultural symbols. It is said that Freud interpreted dreams at the objective level, while Jung did so at the subjective level. According to Jung, if you dream that you talk to an old man that you don't know, and that man's telling you something very important, it means that you should listen to his advice. That old man represents the old wise man, an archetype who's supposed to be your guide and a helper. When such archetypes appear in your dreams, it means your life is going through a period of transformation. The unconscious is not a harmless territory. Therefore, we must be cautious if we are to embark on the journey of dream interpretation. It is better to start with simpler dreams and then to advance to more complex ones, maybe with the help of a psychotherapist. By analysing our dreams, we can understand a great deal about ourselves, who we are inside. 
we can learn things that we never imagined about ourselves. Number six, take time to be alone. Jung teaches us that the highest, most decisive experience is to be alone with one's own self. You must be alone to find out what supports you when you find that you cannot support yourself. For Jung, solitude was highly important, declaring that for him it is a form of healing, making the rest of life worth living. Empty gossip drained Jung of his energy and he often preferred the company of his own thoughts. The experience of solitude gives you more power to face life's challenges. You then better understand the cause of any problem which affects you. You find out what resources you have inside to face that problem. Also, it's a great time to come up with creative ideas concerning your next steps towards anything you want to do in life. Solitude is different from loneliness. Solitude being a voluntary act, while loneliness is an unfortunate situation when you feel disconnected from people without wanting to be. In solitude, you can know yourself much better than when you're with other people. When you're with other people, there is a large chance you will involuntarily start to copy some of their behavior and, somehow, the authenticity of yourself becomes blurry in that interaction. To really know ourselves, we need moments of solitude when we're alone with our thoughts. We should try to have a personal space in our home, a space where nobody disturbs us, where we can meditate, write personal notes, write in a diary, or if this isn't possible, we should take long walks outside, alone, preferably in nature. You will soon feel the benefits of such alone time and we will all get to know ourselves a little better each day we practice solitude. Number seven, ask others what they think about you. In our final quote from Jung for this video, he says, we may think that we fully control ourselves. However, a friend can easily reveal something about us that we have absolutely no idea about. Although Jung spoke many times about the benefits of solitude, which offers one of the best opportunities to investigate your soul and to know yourself better, he also recognized that there are some aspects of our personality that might escape us and only someone else, like a friend or family member or lover, can really spot those aspects. During his lifetime, Jung met several people who had a strong impact on him, helping him know himself better. Some examples are two of his mistresses, Sabina Spielrein and Tony Wolf, who were both his lovers as well as his assistants. They not only helped Jung understand himself better emotionally, but they also helped him in his work. Wolf was the only one who actually helped him define and name the concepts of anima and animus. We should never neglect the role of others in our quest to know ourselves better. For example, you might think that you're a kind person and a very good listener. To test if this is true, ask your closest friend what they think about that. They might well tell you that yes, they know you care about them and that they can count on you when they have serious problems. But when they try to tell you more detail about these issues that they face, you're too eager to try and fix their problems, cutting their speech short rather than letting them explain properly and get it off their chest, which can often be more helpful than trying to offer solutions based on partial information. What others can tell us about ourselves might make for uncomfortable listening sometimes, but we need to ask anyway, and ask for an honest reply if we really want to know the hard truths about ourselves. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to check out our full Philosophies for Life playlist, and for more videos to help you find success and happiness using ancient philosophical wisdom, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching.